Good morning to you, brothers and sisters. Um, we want to thank God for what God has done to us. And we want to thank God that God has called us into this world, but not of this world, so that we become the salt and light of the world, for the world to know that we are his disciples. Let us pray. We are called to love our enemies, but this is very difficult. Let us invite God to direct our thoughts and our prayers. Let us ask God to move in our hearts and minds. Let us ask God to teach and show us what it means to love our enemies. Let us worship him. Father, we thank you that we are loved by you. No matter what, you can call us to let your love flow through us to other people, including those who may have hurt us. Give us the grace and compassion to do this. And give us understanding as we explore this today. In Jesus' name, Amen. I would call uh, Brother Ben to come forward and do the reading of the Word of God. That is coming from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 36. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 36. Ben will do the reading. Praise God, and it's great to be here with you again and uh, to have the honour of reading the Word of God. It's always such a blessing uh, to be entrusted and to be doing this. Uh, as Johnson mentioned, we'll be reading from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 36. It's about Jesus teaching about loving your neighbours. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, Turn to them the other also. If somebody takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And... If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those who, from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sin sinners lend to sinners, expecting it to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. This is the word of the Lord. And praise God, what a, what a challenging scripture. Uh, Johnson's going to bring a strong message today, so bring open ears and we'll get him back. Thanks, Reverend Johnson. Thanks, uh, Brother Ben, for the reading of the Word of God. We want to thank God for giving us this opportunity that we are able to share the Word of God not only here where we are in Australia, but we are able to share the Word of God across the world. I've come up with a theme today. What if Christians can't love their enemies? What if Christians can't love their enemies? That's my theme for today. By telling Christians not to retaliate and not to hate their enemies, Jesus is calling them to an unnatural type of love. The natural reaction to personal injustice is to get even. But Jesus wants us to demonstrate a higher type of love. But to you who are listening, 
who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hate you. So Jesus explained to his disciples that they must live by a higher standard than the world standards. Jesus thought that love must not be selective. His followers are to love all people, regardless of how unlovely or even what style they may be. They also must act on that love by being willing to do good when it is in their power to do it. So the gospel lesson this morning is a continuation of Jesus' sermon on the plain. It is a plain talk, tough talk, hard to listen to talk. We come today to his most difficult teaching. Here is what sets apart the Christian faith from other religious perspectives, philosophic concerns, psychological systems and elemental common sense. And yet at the end of the day, it defines the core of Christian ethics. Love your enemies. This is what Jesus says. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Can we really love our enemies? <laughs> if not, why did Jesus lay on this impossible demand? Why did he lay it on us? Okay, if the teaching troubles you, fear not. You are not the first to back away from this bit of divine fire. Christians have always had a rough time figuring out or crawling out from under the Lord's categorical demand that we love our enemies. Loving our enemies is not a cheap thing. A hundred years ago, the great Christian Albert Suiza held that Jesus, on the early church, which actually recorded the teaching, never intended that we would live like that. At least not for long. Suiza held that the early church believed that Jesus was going to return to earth very soon and in a few years at most, and that the command to love one's enemies was a temporal edict. So when he was reading this, he thought, no, 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 this is not really good. I think the early church was only talking because they thought that Christ was coming soon. What was called an interim ethic. It was like holding your breath. You can do it for a while. But Jesus is not immediately returned and the church was stuck with an ethical command no one can live up to. It's difficult. Paul, who had probably heard about the saying, even though he wrote before the Gospels were completed, but puts an interesting twist on it. Quoting from often less than inspiring book of Proverbs, he says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For by doing so, you heap burning coals upon his head. How many of us will be able to do that? Loving your enemies means acting in their best interest. You can pray for them and think of ways to help them. Jesus loved the war world even though the whole world was in rebellion against God. Jesus asked believers to follow his example by loving their enemies. We can kick and scream and reinterpret the last words, the Lord's words, but when all is said and done, we must conclude that Jesus meant what he said. That is what he said. He said it. Love your enemies. We are to love those who despise us and bless those who kiss us. Indeed, it is at this point the Christian ethic is most vividly edged out in violent, pagan, brutal world filled with hate and bitterness, a world just like ours. So, that's so radical. Someone protests, certainly it is. That's what makes it Christian. We are not certain we want religion to be that radical. We would rather it be so socially acceptable comfortable and in line with the way all that things do. We want religion to fit in the box of our lives. To fit in the ordinary lives that we are used to. Not this thing about talking about loving our enemies. We want a nice, safe, domesticated religion. 
and loving one's enemies is not it. It's not what we look for. Nor is it the way of the world. Not by a long shot. When your enemy is down, you stomp on him. If you hit one cheek, you make sure you hit back twice as hard. If he has one gun, you get two. If she has a big bomb, you get a bigger one. A dozen bigger ones, in fact. That's realistic. That's how the world goes. No doubt about it. So Christians, of course, did not invent love. Nor do we have a monopoly on it. I don't know of any culture or a system which denies the rightness of love. The difference comes in defining whom you love. The world says, love those who love you. That is what, what the world teaches. So we come here to church, and we continue to love those we love. We forget about what God said, what Jesus said. As we come here into this building, we love one another. Nothing wrong with that. That's what I can say. But one doesn't need to hold the Christian faith or any faith for that matter. To love those who love you, you don't need the Christian faith. You don't need any religion. It's automatic. As Jesus said, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. Anyone can do that. So Matthew's version, as Jesus said, they have their reward. People who love those who love them back. So the phrase is derived from a Greek term stamped on bills. Mark his receipt paid in full. So loving those who love you is no more than a mutual certificate or commercial transaction. It's just like a transaction. But if we take this text seriously, we are confronted with much more than a commercial transaction. Something beyond the way of the world. Something beyond the ethic of mutual satisfaction. We have a whole new radical, difficult, perhaps impossible ethic we are being faced with. So Jesus no implies that Christians won't have enemies. No, he never said that. He never said because now you become a Christian, you will never have enemies. No. Why I like to think Christians are able to get along with everybody. I remember Jesus said, Beware when all speak well of you. <laughs> if I never do or say anything that is going to disturb maybe the racists, those who trust in violence, those who live of injustice, the insensitive, the crude, the rude, I may never have an enemy. But neither will I have been faithful to the gospel. Christians will have enemies, all right? What they need to be certain of is that they have the right enemies. Because we are preaching the gospel of the kingdom. For the people to accept Christ, sometimes they get angry at you. I am not afraid of being controversial. History is God's controversy with the faithfulness. If Christianity implies being so neutral about everything that you never have an enemy to contend with, Jesus wasn't much of a Christian. While there's no virtue in going around making enemies, and while Christians should try and get along with everyone, if we are faithful, there will always be those who try to silence us. If you are faithful to the word of God, there are people ready to silence what you're doing. How are we supposed to love our enemies? Can we take a pill, or quote a verse, or say a prayer which changes our hearts? If I do not love someone, can I twist myself around? Convince myself that if I, in fact, I do love them. Can I banish, as if slight of hand, my negative attitude? If that is what it takes, I may get an A for that. But F for performance. I can't make myself love those I detest. Or who detests me? If you can, please share your secret. <laughs> what is happening? How do you love them? How do you do it? Show me your secret. If I cannot feel differently, perhaps I can act differently. And the difference in how I act is the only way I will be able to change my mind. Bless 
those who curse you. Says Jesus, pray for those who abuse you. To a person who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other. And as you wish that people do to you, do so to them. How many of us will be in that situation? In that scenario where someone strikes this cheek, you offer them another. I think it's a difficult one. Okay, let me tell you now. The secret is in the doing. I may not be able to control my feelings, nor can I pretend to feel different than I do. But I can control my actions. As I've told people in counseling, it is often easier to act your way into a new set of feelings than it is to feel your way into a new set of actions. If I'm on the house with someone and I wait until my opinion, my mood, my feelings changes, chances are I'll wait forever. The only hope of breaking the logjam is if one of us namely me, myself, if me, Johnson, changes how I act, then it will work. Then it will work. I may not be able to change my attitude unless I first change my behavior. That may be the only hope I have of turning my enemy into a friend. It's about me. We will never resolve international issues by throwing an army at someone or threatening them with bombs. That may temporarily keep the peace, but it won't solve the problem. But when we learn to treat our enemies differently, there is hope. As James said to the early church, let us not love in word and speech, but in deed and truth. These are the words from James. Whoever said, if you want peace, prepare for war. Head and come within a million miles for the Christian ethic, which says, if you want peace, prepare for peace. In the world, you deal with enemies by throwing them. In the kingdom of God, we have been called to be a kingdom people. You deal with enemies by loving them. It is the only chance you have to make them friends. By loving people, Exceptionally. Swiss are held that the early church never claimed Christians could live by absolute love, at least for long. Nevertheless, that is our goal. The saying of Jesus in this sermon on the brain are not in a diagram of how things work in the world, but a picture of how things work in God's kingdom. So this is what Jesus came to bring, and that is what the church in the world is. To evidence. Okay, there is another way to order life. A way the world does not understand. We are not stuck with the law of tooth and fang. We are the advance. The part of God's kingdom. So we are the church. We have been assigned the task of etching out a bay-headed, a beach-headed the kingdom on the inhospitable shores of a world now ruled by ethical revenge and violence. That is what is ruling the world at the present moment. The world is talking about revenge and violence. But we as Christians, we are preaching peace and love. That is our message. We are God's emissaries. We live as if the kingdom has already come. For in us, by the grace of God, it is now in our midst, however imperfectly. We live and work by faith, giving our soul in service to the one whose kingdom is both in our midst or on the way. For the coming of that kingdom, we pray, waiting for that day when it is real on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Here and also out there. So I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters, that we have been called for something very important. We have been called for something very important. It may be very difficult, but this is important 
message. What if Christians don't love their enemies? Can we really love our enemies? By the rules of the world, probably not. But by the grace of God, we can and must. So it's a must here. Okay, listen very careful here. In conclusion, if you are someone who says that you cannot or will not forgive, then you should fear for your soul. Saying, I cannot or I will not forgive is essentially another way of saying, I'm thinking about going to hell. Did you get me? I'm saying, saying I cannot or will not forgive is essentially another way of saying I am thinking about going to hell. That is what you are saying indirectly. Why do I say that? Jesus said in Matthew 6 verse 14 and 15, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. Which means it has to start with you to forgive. For you to receive forgiveness from God. So this is what you are required. It is not forgiving us that saves us or merits our salvation. Rather, it is our characteristic of those who have received grace that they are willing to share it with others. Quaking doesn't make you a duck, but ducks do quake. Forgiving does not make you a Christian, but Christians do forgive. Christians do forgive. But believers who are citizens of heaven, citizens of future heaven, don't need to retaliate. Don't need to hold a grudge. Hang on to every item they own. They are freed to forgive and to give. This is the message that we are being told. So, if Christians can't forgive, can't love, it means they are preaching their own message, not the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom calls us to forgive, to love our enemies. That's what we are being called to. So, brothers and sisters, I want you and I urge you to follow the gospel of the kingdom, which is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, to those who are listening to me, I call you to love your enemies. Full stop. May God bless you from now and evermore. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we confess that we are, we nature enmity and hold grudges against those we think of as enemies. They are usually in the wrong and we are probably in the right. But we confess, Lord, that sometimes we are equally to blame or at least not entirely innocent. No matter who started it or how it began, perhaps a swift word of reconciliation or a genuine attempt to understand to sort things out would have been nipped matters in the bud. Sometimes we know that life is not so simple. Help us to know what we to do, how to respond. For sometimes we should turn the other cheek. Sometimes we should keep things in check. Sometimes we should simply turn and walk away for our own good. We confess that the complexities of life all confuse us. Please help us understand what you would have done to us. Bless us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, 
we ask you, we urge you, if you find that God is talking something to your life, and in response you want to say, thank you, Lord, it's time for you to take your offering and give to the minister of the kingdom. It's not our ministry, it's the minister of the kingdom. So it's high time now you take your offering and I will pray for it and give it to God. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for the love that you have shown to us. We thank you have called us that we are in the world but not of the world. And we are here to imitate you by loving our enemies. Father, they persecuted you. They treated you badly. They spat on you. They mobbed you. And your words were, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Father, we thank you that through your word we have been renewed. And now it's our time to say thank you. As we give our offering, Father, we want to hear more about the kingdom of God. So, Father, bless everyone who is listening to this, who is giving their offerings. May you bless them, Father so that their offerings could be used for the expansion of God's kingdom. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let us receive grace. Lord, thank you that we, we are loved and forgiven by you. We know it is hard to love those who have hurt us. Give us the strength. Help us to love our enemies. Help us to do good to those who hate and hate us. Help us to know when we have hurt others and to repent and seek only to do good. In Jesus' name, amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you all. See you next week.